creators of Relevant Magazine. This is the Relevant Podcast. Oh, yeah. Candles burning low. Lots of mistletoe. Lots of snow and ice. Everywhere we go. Choir singing carols. Right outside my door. All these things and more. All these things and more. That's what Christmas means to me, my love. Christmas means to me, my love. This week of Friday, December 8th, 2017. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm doubling down. Happy holiday. I'm, ho- I'm your host, Cameron Strang. And this week's show is brought to you by Samaritan Ministries, a ministry that helps members share their medical needs. Every month, more than 69,000 households give generously to other members with a qualified medical need through Samaritan Ministries International, one of the leading healthcare sharing ministries in America. Members send checks, prayers, and notes of encouragement directly to other members in need. Healthcare sharing is a unique opportunity for members to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The Samaritan Ministries direct sharing model is a biblical approach to paying for healthcare based on passages like Galatians 6 2, which says to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's a charge they take seriously among their members and within the Samaritan family. Currently, one person memberships start at $100 a month, two person memberships start at $200, and three people and more uh, start at $250. You can find out more by visiting SamaritanMinistries.org. Well, like I said, I'm your host, Cameron Strang, and here with me in our Orlando studios, Eddie Big Hat Koffeltz. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Over there on the ones and twos, our illustrious producer, my brother, Chandler Strang. Hello. Also here in the studio today, joining us, our managing editor, Andre Henry. Yo, thank goodness. And on the Skype line from Loverland, Virginia, Jesse Carey. Hello, hello. He is the reason for the season. Yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going with. And when we're speaking of he, that's we're speaking of Andre. Show. And I am so glad that he is here because I feel like between us, yeah. he's replacing Jesse. Right? <laughs> On the show, like, Jesse's time is kind of coming. Hey, we have a great uh, show in store for you today. Uh, coming up later, you know when when uh, sometimes on, on like SNL, Drake is the host and the musical guest? Yes. We got our own Drake this week. Are you interviewing me? Cody Carnes. Oh, Worst of leader, Cody Carnes is the guest <laughs> and the... And he's doing a live in studio performance of a couple of new songs. We'll just say, we'll just say from now on, Drake is the rest of the show. So. <laughs> and then Cody Carnes is going to be on. Right. Another podcast very popularly just used the Pope to to uh, to promote their show. So yeah, yeah. Drake on the we show. We didn't today. just well, hold on, we didn't use the Pope to promote the show. The Pope came on to our show. Uh, he didn't know that he was being on our show, but he was on our show. And he wrote Dude, his new no. sports podcast. I think it may have been the first ever just straight up like gorilla. You guys guest. kind of. Of catfish the Pope. Oh, completely. <laughs> yeah. If he had known or his handlers had known, they would have been yeah, like... Hey, I mean, look, it's not. I don't feel bad about it. I, I used his name in the title of the episode, but I gave him co-billing with Ken Shamrock. So. Is it like one of those things where like... Obama sings "Call Me Maybe" like you just cut up the Pope's words and made him sing a random pop song. Yeah. Yeah. no, we had we I, had I, our I, would, I would listen to that room. on your yeah. sports show if you cut up Pope speeches <laughs> to make him part of the cast. That'd be great. <laughs> no, we we had one of our hosts, uh, Steve Carter, go to the Vatican and have an interview one on one. By interview, I mean one question that the Pope misheard and the translator botched, <laughs> and it was very awkward between the two. <laughs> and we re we we replayed it. <laughs> and that's that is uh, an interview I stand by. I feel like it's one of the best of the year. So can I give you a little behind the scenes of yeah. that though? So two days before they're recording the actual <laughs> show, I'm talking to Jesse on the phone, and Jesse is already tickled about this whole idea. Yeah. And he goes, "The way we're going to start the show is I'm going to call it the Pope Cast." And then he just laughs and laughs, and then he did it on the show. <laughs> like it was pretty funny, but like you can, like that was a big. I make no, I make no apologies for for the Pope Cast special. It was, it was a, uh, it was a history making podcast for it, the ages. It sure was. So Drake on the show today. I, uh, Eddie, it's <laughs> holiday season. A lot of people are getting sick. Oh yeah, and mm-hmm. it sounds like you yourself are yes. among those. I'm either sick or turning into Chad Michael Snavely. I'm not quite sure which is happening. Yeah, you're kind of Tom Waits in it this yeah, this yeah. week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, I had no voice yesterday. Really? And uh yeah, I woke up, had a voice, but it's still it's as masculine as I've ever felt. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz usually it's just kind of a You walked in with a little more swagger I noticed this morning. <laughs> oh, did I? Mm-hmm. Cool. I felt pretty cool this morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just I finally had a voice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, 
uh, cigarette smoke makes me very nauseous, but <laughs> it would be cool to have that grisly voice of someone who smokes like unfiltered Marlboro Reds, yeah. you know? I got and super I think you're kind of pulling it off today, dude. Yeah, I'm really into menthols this week. So that's, that's <laughs> that sounds like it. Now that you said that, that's all I can hear. <laughs> it does. It Eddie, sounds... Eddie's like an old grandma who smoked menthols for 40 like Mar- years. Marge's sisters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says someone addicted to Newports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, I got to be here because the show is like well, frankly, Drake. It's, it's a big, it's a big yeah. week. Yeah, and it's yeah, just terrible got, without me. We got Drake. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> well, moving the show along, it's uh, time for our look back at what happened this week in culture and entertainment. It's time for in case you missed it. Hey, in case you missed it, this week our, our good buddy John Christ uh, released a new video promoting Christian Alexa. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll keep your internet interactively, uh, extremely pure. The ad, uh, you know, quote unquote is for the believers alternative to the Amazon echo. Um, and, uh, it kind of went viral this week. Here's a clip. And each Christian Alexa is uniquely programmed to help you with your individual struggles. Hey, you want something to drink? That better be a Coke bottle. Order your Christian Alexa today <laughs> and begin seeing immediate life improvements. Let's eat. How about let's pray? From the makers of Pure Flix and GodTube comes Christian Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, play Game of Thrones. Are you sure you should be watching that? Give the oh, gift no. of Christian Alexa and have a happy holiday. You mean Merry Christmas. You know, let's just not even worry about You know what, let's just listen to some music. You want to do that? Yeah. Alexa, play a song to set the mood. How about I call your accountability partner? <laughs> okay, you know what? All right, Christian Alexa. Now available at family bookstores. <laughs> yeah. Family bookstores. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know, you know. The sad thing is, it's not that far from like a product that someone oh, in the no. Christian industry has probably already thought. Oh, of. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We're laughing at something that someone else would be like, "Oh, oh yeah, this is." This I is guess we're stuff. canceling the, our, our Christian <laughs> digital assistant. Yeah, this is the future. That's John hilarious. Chris, man, that guy is really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, in case you missed it, changes may be coming to The Simpsons following the release of the documentary The Problem with Apu. Yeah. Uh, actor Hank Azaria, who voices several characters on the long-running show, including Quickie Mart owner Apu, told TMZ that the new film from comedian Hari Kandabalu has caused The Simpsons team to think about what to do with the controversial character. The documentary looks at the legacy of Apu, who is largely based on Indian stereotypes, and how damaging those types of cultural characters can be. Azaria explained, I think the documentary made some really interesting points and gave us a lot at The Simpsons to think about. And we really are thinking about it. Anybody who is hurt or offended by any character or vocal performance, it's really upsetting that that was hurtful to anybody. And I think that's an important conversation and one definitely worth having. So thanks for asking. On Twitter, Kondabulu um, responded, encouraging the show to respond thoughtfully. He wrote, to The Simpsons writers, please do not remove Apu from The Simpsons. Killing him is lazy writing and an insult to the show's legacy. Let him be upwardly mobile and own multiple quickie marts. Let his kids talk. Plots have been repeating for years and tweaks provide tons of new stories. I uh, like that. That's that's good. Yeah, this, that's, he, this whole Apu thing was like... I was I was like a little embarrassed for me because I was like, oh, this is this is super messed up, and it's been hiding yeah. in plain sight. Like yeah. as soon as he, I saw the trailer for the film, I was like, that is a terrible, well, I, you know, and thing, it, right? Because I've laughed at the Simpsons, and you just I just took it. But it when is it dawned on me, well, how messed up it was was the <clears throat> episode of The Office where they had yeah. the racial diversity, and then. Kelly had uh, Indian on, you know, the the game yeah. they did the role playing game, right? And then Michael's impression was almost basically right. Apu, yeah, and right. it was like, oh my goodness, like yeah. he's pulling from something that's really, yeah, not well, great. And, and in the like documentary, this. they look at the roots of the character and how Hank Azaria, who, in case you don't know, is a white actor, how he came up with the voice, which was essentially just doing the most comically exaggerated, stereotypical voice. Uh, of uh, an Indian uh, person that he possibly could imagine and 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 doing it just for laughs. And, uh, you know, because the show's been around so long and because uh, it, a lot of it is based on social satire, that character has gotten a pass. But what made that this particular documentary so compelling is it really does look at the nuances to see why, you know, it, it shouldn't get a pass and, and the character should be reexamined in kind of our, our modern understanding of what is culturally not cool anymore yeah like that that example of michael's uh of the office is like yeah that's for some people that's the apu is the only quote-unquote indian person they know right and i think that's the thing that like it it kind of highlights for people like and that's when it's like wow that is really messed up right but i do appreciate that in the 
in the in the documentary, he did take the approach like, and what the quote you just read. Yeah, it's the, like the tweet. We I, can make Apu a great character, right? You know? And That's I right. thought, well, what a thoughtful middle ground because I thought they would just want it like shut I, down the Simpsons, shut like, down it, Apu, like, like shut it, down. I, I would have thought it would have been almost like a, a blackfish moment for the show. Like, you know, you guys are messed up. You, this needs to stop, you know. But you're right. Yeah, this is a different direction. Yeah. That's surprising and, and I, productive. And I love SeaWorld, and I have made very clear how much I love SeaWorld, and I think blackfish was all a lie. I think, <laughs> I think, I think all of was the animals... Was the moon landing <laughs> real? You can't prove that it was. <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. You understand what I'm saying. No, like, that's a really great solution also because, like, to just take a poo off the show... Right. also plays into the stereotype. Yeah. Because it yeah. says the only way that we can imagine an Indian character yeah. right. is according to the stereotype. All, yeah, all or right. nothing. Right. Yeah. I love I love the idea of like evolve him. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Well and even well, I was gonna say, and even the character of like groundskeeper Willie came up. Like does does do, does other uh, characters, both minor and major, on the show. Is it time really for them is to the be re-examined? Scottish Not guy? necessarily yeah. cut off the show, but keeper. definitely re-examined. You know who I think is really the the stereotype really bugs me is the old white men on the show. I mean, Mr. Burns is just they made him mean. You yeah. know, it's just <laughs> I, and yeah. Because if there's anything we've learned in recent weeks, it's that old white men are not mean and <laughs> depraved. So <laughs> yeah, they are to be trusted and revered. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that that powerful old white men can be trusted in all scenarios how dare you simpsons and mr burns You've, we've learned nothing from that yeah. satire hey in case you missed it this week uh, td jakes released a shocking video about the modern uh, slave trade the potter's house pastor and writer recently returned from a trip to north africa where he witnessed the horror of uh, the modern day slavery firsthand as he explains in the clip more than a million migrants have fled to libya where they are sold into slavery for as little as 400 dollars a person uh, Jake's encourages followers to share the clip and raise awareness about the reality of the issue that's become accelerated in some areas because of the migrant crisis. Here's a clip. They think they're following a dream to Europe. They end up in the mall, in the grip of these rapacious smugglers. Many of you know that I recently spent quite a bit of time in Africa. Even if I had not, I would have to say something about this. Nearly a million migrants have fled into Libya and are being sold into slavery. That's atrocious. For the price of $400, a person loses their future, their dignity, their pride, and sometimes their life. I've got friends, black, white, and brown, who say had they lived in slavery times, they wouldn't have made it because they would have said something. Well, the bad old times are back, and I want to challenge you to say something. Why are we not hearing more about this in the press, in the paper, on the news? Let our voice be heard. Repost. Do everything you can. We've got to say something. We cannot be silent. Not again. To be clear, that was not me doing the voiceover. I was going to say. <laughs> I was listening to it. And I'm yeah. like, man, Eddie's passionate. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, I know. <laughs> not to, but you know, I I think this is something that I'm glad he's raising awareness yeah. of, and what organizations like IJM and the Indian Movement are doing. A21. It, it, you know, yeah. it shines a light on why that's so important because, um, you know, millions of think about that, a million people. That that is unfathomable, what? and. I, what are they thinking? Is I mean, I, I the, specifically what's happening in Libya. Educate me on what's happening there. The are, is it that the migrants are thinking that they're yes. uh, getting access to Europe and a new life, and yes. what's happening is they are being yes, they are being promised in. a job and promised the hope of a better life, and they are starving and dying. And so, even though they know realistically, like this may not this may not be safe. Someone is saying, "We will take you to Europe. We will give you this job. This will provide for your family. This will be." basically the like the the European dream the American dream and they're they're going for it and so what happens so in, even if I have to go and and work for this family or whatever at least I, I am provided a life uh, and so it's indentured but, servanthood but, but basically. what they don't know is that they're thinking okay I'm going to work as a you know to work for this family what they don't know and they aren't told is is that they are given a room there, but they are never allowed to leave that room. They're not told all the details. They're not told right. that no one speaks the language. They're not told that they aren't getting citizenship there, so they can never leave or do anything. They're not told that they are going to be, that there is somebody that essentially owns them that is like like the mafia, just continually doing compound interest on some false debt that they yeah. are owed. So they are never able to repay that debt, and they are coerced by 
fear and violence to stay exactly where they are and continue to work for basically free and nothing. It, right. It, so it, it's, it, go ahead, Jess. I was going to say, it's also similar to the situation that has unfolded in Qatar where the migrant workers were brought in under the promises of building these kind of stadiums for World Cup and oh, they would yeah. be able to provide for their families. But the reality is as soon as they enter the country, their passports and tra- travel documents are confiscated by their employer, who it looks like the government is very complicit in this scheme and placed in a, what is like Eddie was saying, it is simply these like rundown dormitory style prisons where they're forced to work in completely unsafe conditions and really have no recourse. Or, or a chance to get their life back. And I love that T.D. Jakes is bringing more awareness because you would think that, because people were genuinely shocked by this video and like couldn't believe that there's a slave in the world, yet there are 40 million slaves in the world. There are more mm-hmm. slaves right now than at any other time in human history. And the lack of awareness that we have as a general public is helped a lot by someone like T.D. Jakes using his profile and saying like, hey, this is happening all around the globe. I, the, I mean, I through the work of IJM and A21 and others, I mean, obviously modern day slavery has been an issue that particularly the younger generation of the church has yeah. been very vocal about over yeah. the mm-hmm. last four to five years. A passion Conference yeah. raised millions and tens mm-hmm. of millions of dollars uh, for uh, to fight uh, there on Capitol Hill. You yeah. see Lou Giglio and, yeah. you know, I, so is... What's happening specifically, what, what, what Dr. Jakes' video is shining light on, is that different than the stuff that we've been hearing about? Is this because of the migrant crisis in particular that there's almost like a new people group getting sucked into this? Because we knew, we know, we've yes. known about it for a few years, but this is new. Right. It's, it's a new hotspot okay. right? because of the differential in power, because those that do not have are so stark from those that do have. So it's a new hotspot. It is a very old problem and right. a very old formula. So, he so it's sh- the same thing happening just to right. a new people group. Right. Almost. Wherever there, wherever there is poverty, wherever there is, yeah, essentially wherever there is poverty, there is slavery. I mean, it's happening in India. It's happening. I mean, right. it's you know, happening in Orlando, right? It's happening right. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think the, 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 this is a, a symptom of just how um, devastating the migrant crisis is because it leads you be because it, it heightens the sense of desperation because people are leaving their homes and often have no way to return. Um, and and it, it just is another um, show of how. Yes. important it is for the migrant crisis to be um, addressed because like it's like in Gary Halligan's book what is it, the locust effect Eddie yeah. it's w- w- which looks at it not just solving the problem of these injustices but looking at the root of the problem of these injustices and trying to figure out how those can be addressed so that future generations can end the cycle of, of this type of injustice but what's particularly scary about like a, a Syri- like uh, Libya and places where there is a refugee crisis is like when IJM works effectively, we are essentially working in a place that has some established form of government and we start to restart that government. We restart the laws that are in place. But in a place where there is a refugee crisis, there's no support system. There's no, there aren't like police to help. There aren't judges to make, or like to make arrests. It's really a really, really particularly difficult situation in places where there is uh, a refugee population being enslaved because there's just no, there's nobody there to help. And that's what makes it super sad. And and not to make this overly political, but the, um, the president's, (laughs) um, the president's refugee ban was recently approved once again, uh, by federal courts. And for people that don't know, it bans, uh, uh, basically all travel to eight countries that the uh, current administration has deemed to be, uh, uh, you know, that the people there, that the people in need there that would seek refuge in the United States, um, you know, uh, at this time, you know, that he looks at them as a national security risk. Libya is on that list. Yeah. That's why it's important that when you hear these political issues and that play on emotions like fear, Dig into what's actually happening there, because the people that are being banned from seeking refuge that are from that country or are in that country right now, 
a, a, a lot of them are desperate to get out and it's a life or death situation. So when looking at things that may have political implications, look at the nuance there, because like I said, Libya is on that list of countries that of people who are among the most desperate in the entire world. Hey, in case you missed it on the other end of the spectrum, uh, House of Cards, Eddie's favorite Netflix show. Whew. Oh, the uh, show. I thought it was just our whole entire world. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, return for one last season with, with Claire Underwood as it. the lead. As it should have been. Uh, after Kevin yeah. Spacey was fired from the show after some very serious sexual abuse allegations arose, uh, questions swirled around if and how House of Cards would deal with his absence or if it would return at all uh, when production of the final season had been suspended. It's now been announced that Robin Wright will take Spacey's place as the primary lead. Uh, she's had a contentious relationship with the show's producers in the past, explaining that she never got equal uh, pay despite her character's importance. She told the Rockefeller Foundation last year, I was looking at the statistics and Claire Underwood's character was more popular than Frank's for a period of time. So I capitalized on it. I was like, you better pay me or I'm going to go public. However, she later said, I don't think I'm getting paid the same amount. They told me I was getting a raise, but... I don't think so. Hey, so. now, hey, now, guess who holds all the cards? Oh, it makes sense. I mean, the last Stupid. season was going that way anyway. It set it up perfectly yes. for her to take over. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Which is why I wasn't like, why wasn't that their first thought anyway? When they were like, well, we're going to have to move Spacey out of out of here. Like, why right. didn't they automatically just go? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, Claire Underwood was al- already had the upper hand at the end of the season. No yeah, problem. Maybe of how to spin the the narrative of getting rid of the, the character or something yeah. like that. That's why they had to. Doug just it tosses him in front of a train. Done. <laughs> there you go. Now we Doug. continue on. <laughs> How are they going to kill him off, though? I mean, are they killing him off? They, they uh, probably had to have like a really good you know, like, plot is it, twist or something. To, is it going to be like a forward. Princess Leia thing with Star Wars, where it's just like there's a hologram Kevin Spacey <laughs> getting <laughs> pushed in front of a bus? Yeah, I don't think they can have his face anywhere on that show. Yeah. I don't think he'll, I bet he will not appear in any way, shape, or form. And I bet they yeah. won't kill him off. Well, I, I well then how would you explain him vanishing? I mean, you can tr- he's just not on the show. He's traveled off or he's just not right. He, they, they got a divorce and he moves back to his home state and now they're doing, or just, now, it, now it, she's in charge or something. It, or it but just like happens off camera and is acknowledged. Like when Charlie Sheen uh, ran afoul of the producers of Two and a Half Men back in the day, they <laughs> they comically casually killed him off and, made jo- and had the other characters make jokes about how grisly his death was so like they could do something like that right? <laughs> or they could uh fresh prince mom it and just yeah, right. re- 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 else. kevin spacey <laughs> another white guy yeah. Yeah. Uh, any another there are plenty of guy. other upper middle-aged white guys yeah. to choose from they're not many they do that on shows all, out, but they do that on shows all the time though where they just find someone else to play the character i mean yeah it, i mean it's, it's darren it's the darren from bewitch thing yeah, they can't just like casually dismiss Frank Underwood, though, because his character would not go down without a fight. So I think that they have to do something drastic with this character. It is just wild, though, that he can't be on the episode. He yeah. can't. They can't write him off with him in it. He yeah, just, that's what I'm saying. Like, won't that, well, that's the Star Wars thing. You could just do the young Princess Leia thing. But what if just, he just has like a heart attack in his sleep or something? You know? Oh, yeah, that's classic. well, you still would see a body being. Well, I guess you could do a body double for it, like yeah. Yeah. being carried out of the house. or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Everybody's like, I think we know our question of the week. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, we- <laughs> how should Frank Underwood be Underwood be killed off off camera? Remember, he's a horrible person. And so <laughs> yeah. get creative here in real life and on the show. I'm yes. kind of glad so, that uh, Frank Underwood isn't going to be back. I really started to hate him. Oh, like, Claire was then. always the most compelling part of that show. Yeah. Hey, in case you missed it, Chris Pratt, uh, our good friend, Chris Pratt. Yeah. Not really. I just said that about John Chris. I want to be friends with Chris Pratt. He seems like he's like a fun he, guy. He seems like he'd be able to hop in on this show without. Oh, no problem. Like, no problem. Yeah. He's yeah. asked, but we we can't mess up the chemistry. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> We're very particular. <laughs> you know, what we've got here is pretty special. Chris Pratt sang a very weird duet with Chris Stapleton on Jimmy Kimmel Live this week. Uh, he filled in as a guest host on the late night show. And uh, it was when Jimmy had to be off for his daughter. Medical uh, his uh, heart son surgery, had a son heart yeah. surgery. Yeah. Eight I love that son. he has a guest yeah. host on. Very old yeah. Letterman. So he filled it as a guest host on the late night show and had the country star spin a wheel featuring a variety of totally random songs. The duo landed on the dirty dancing anthem. I had the time of my life <laughs> and uh, sang a truly strange take on the hit. Here is a clip. <laughs> Tell you something 
That's Eddie's favorite song, done in a new way. It's my Eddie, we, when you were watching that and you saw a, 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 a dirty dancing song, oh, it's one of the thin slices of pizza on that spinning wheel. Were you just standing up with your fingers crossed and did it you was, just shout like someone hit a, a game-winning three-pointer when they landed on it? It was the first time since the election that I just prayed for an outcome, and it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. For any outcome. Any, something Expect I, a miracle. Please, I really want the dirty dancing. I thing. need and this. I yeah. need this, God. <laughs> yeah, God answers prayer. Respect a miracle. I went to a, Jesse and I both went to Oral Roberts University, yeah. and it's a oh, small yeah. Christian college mm-hmm. with, but Division One athletics because the found, uh, Oral Roberts, the televangelist who founded the university, believed in sports being uh, a platform for the gospel. Like he, he was like the sports page is the every man's Bible. <laughs> so he's like, if we can be excellent in sports then, you know, we can be a light in the darkness sort of a thing, right? Sure, great. So Works for me. So they invested <laughs> a lot in the sports, had this big arena on campus, yeah. Division I yeah. athletics. And so, you know, we're playing Oklahoma and Texas and Oklahoma State and, yeah. you know, the big schools, Kansas. And our basketball court uh, says Oros University on one baseline and on the other baseline in massive letters. I'm mean, like the entire length of the court. Expect a miracle. <laughs> wow. And it's like, it doesn't inspire that much confidence. And I was like, hey, maybe we can win. Hey, yeah. expect a miracle. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, that's the most demoralizing Christian <laughs> yeah. phrase you can wow. put on a sports yeah. court. Wow. That's really funny. It's still there. I mean, well, they why keep not? I can updating. do all things or like victory in Christ or something, yeah. you know? Victory, I don't know. That's a little weird, but you know, yeah, expect yeah. a miracle. I was just like, that's the most like self deprecating faith statement As if ever. You'd ever win. If you're going to win, it's going to be a miracle. Right. Yeah. I just want, you know, <laughs> well, I, I want to well, honor well. the legacy of Vore Roberts, who loves sports so much. Who knew that one day one of his former students would start a sports podcast and quote unquote interview the Pope? <laughs> now, again, did the Pope know that he was being interviewed for a podcast? Those are unclear because of translation issues. The Pope seemed very unclear about what was happening happening in general, but <laughs> I feel like we honored the legacy of good oil there. And, so. and see what he did was it's normally called a podcast, right. but he changed the beginning of the Pope. The Pope. So it's every man's, every man's Bible. <laughs> Jokes like that. Jokes like that land with every man. Sometimes the jokes puns. write themselves. Those are called puns, Eddie. <laughs> Rest in peace, Oral Roberts. Is he dead? Yes. He yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's oh, not like geez. I thought he should be. I'm just saying it's been a while. Well, he was very uh, they, old. I mean, he, yeah. It was an awkward transition in how they wrote him off. Good boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'll do it for in case you missed it. Stay tuned. Up next, Slices. You're listening to Nicole Miller. The song is Blindfolded. At the beginning of the podcast, you heard uh, What Christmas Means to Me, CeeLo Green, the remake of the famous Stevie Wonder song. Okay, it's time for slices. What do you have, Jesse? Okay, before I get into my slice, guys, I had a great idea just now about yeah. how they can kill off Frank Underwood. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of a new twist in the final season. Of the wait, wait. Okay, go ahead. Because they've kind of been in the lane, this political drama for a yeah. while, you know, yeah. it's the last yeah. season. Why don't you just have a little fun with it? So here's the thing. I always love those 90s movies, like where a kid in, inherits the Chicago Cubs and becomes the manager yes. or, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know that type of thing. That would happen all, like the kid cashes like a million dollar check and buys oh, a mansion. Yeah. He's like the boss, you know? Yeah, this stuff boss. happened all the time in yeah, 90s movies. It did. It's yeah. an incredible joke. All the time. So first kid with Sinbad, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a running thing. It's a great thing. Yeah. People like uh-huh. seeing kids in positions of power. It's hilarious. Check. I think it was the one. That- yeah. 
Yeah. Like, yeah, blank check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Richie Rich. Or no, he was born oh, rich. Yeah. 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 <laughs> e- either way, either way. You guys yeah. know the trope. Yeah. I think they diagnose Frank Underwood with Benjamin Button disease. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he suddenly <laughs> he, he, he suddenly starts rapidly aging in reverse. Okay. So the title card comes so so it <laughs> it's the opening scene, it's very dramatic, and a doctor yeah. a doctor comes in with a clipboard and he yeah. finds Claire and he's got I've got sad news for oh you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Frank is 12. For Frank has been diagnosed with Benjamin Dutton disease. And then it fast forwards and it's like, tw- you know, uh, six you months know, later. Three years later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's, he's now a, a hilarious 12 year old boy. And that's, and it's, it's very much a comedy with for the last house on the lawn. And, oh, oh yeah. 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 Now that's how they're, I just realized joking aside, that's how they're going to do it. Right. They're just going to flash the four years later card. Oh yeah, that they're is. They're gonna how do they're that. Gonna do He's. They'll do flashbacks. He's dead. She's now been president for a while or whatever. She's running for re-election. They never have to. I mean, they'll address it, but that's how they'll do it. It's gonna be the season that takes place in the future. Ah. <laughs> I they just that. took all the fun out of it. Very possible. <laughs> the beauty of mine is that by the final episodes, he's a baby and he's the president. Yeah. A baby president? That idea alone is hilarious. <laughs> it's like, look who's talking to uh, House of Cards. Yeah. Look yeah. who's talking three, I guess. With, yeah. Sometimes he's just right themselves. What was the in it? First kid. First yeah. kid. That's yeah, first right. kid. And then yeah. the genie movie. And the genie Speaking movie. Speaking of uh, baby president. <laughs> the, the genie movie. <laughs> Do you guys remember Michael Scott's pitch for for um, for an inspirational movie about a world leader? What's it that? was buried. I was I was uh, binging. I'm doing... There's a listicle that went up on the site this week that people... Um, I'm all about the plugs right now. I'm ranking all of the characters on The Office, and so I was doing some research by, by binge watching some old episodes. And oh, right. really, can, can you give me a spoiler? Who'd you put? Who'd you put uh, number one? Oh, there's only one answer. Go it's on. very controversial. Well, actually, uh, I'm curious because I have a strong opinion about this. Okay, here's how I based it. I said that this character gets more laughs on a pure on, on a uh, per okay, line basis. If you're basis. going Creed, you're wrong. Yeah. Creed Brat number yeah, one. I knew it. Because here's why. He would fit as just as well on Always Sunny as he would on The Office. He's hilariously no, depraved. The and every with, line he has is hilarious. The yeah. problem with your line of thinking is you've got to think about if the per- character was removed, how would it affect the show? Right. Yeah. You Creed. could remove him and it would not affect the show I one didn't say. I didn't I'm say not most sure valuable. Creed was on the last four seasons. He just right. but he, he would go still. away for episodes at a time. Right, right, right. That's right. Yeah, I, you're wrong. He's a role player, man. You're basically said it's, that like it's Michael Scott. It has to be Michael. He Scott. He was number two. He was. Number you're two. basically yeah. saying Kyle Corver is the most important player on the Cavs. That's what you just said. I said. I, I said <laughs> this is this is ranking the best characters. I think Creed is oh, funnier. The Kyle Corver comes in and he shoots, you know, four shots, it, but he hits three fourths it, of them. It, it's, so. it's too much of a mixed metaphor. It's too much of a mixed metaphor with sports <laughs> in the show. Like he, Creed is a gem on that show. Michael was number two. Uh, so Cameron, who would you have number number one? I, I mean, I, the only thing you're debating is between Dwight, Michael, or Jim. Uh, you know, that's what yeah, I, that's, that's for number yeah. one. I have one of those because the last. show is completely different without one any of those, of those dead three. Is that what you just one said? of those three that you Jim just Halpert named is, is dead, dead last. last for Jesse. I know he doesn't like Jim. Jim Halpert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he's just below. He's just below Robert. Oh, yeah. He does not like Jim as a sociopath, right? Oh I'm just okay. it for you. Okay. okay, okay, okay. His pranks on Dwight sports. are funny. Okay, hold on. Let me let Listen, me say his is. pranks on Dwight are funny but frequently mean. He, he was, was a, a total jerk to Karen. Yep. Even after they were married, he could be sort of a jerk to Pam. Yeah. Um, and he, he thought he was he's better than everyone on the show. Yeah, like. That's true. Jim, I didn't ever laugh. I, I I understood his role on the show, but he never calls me to laugh, and and I don't like him as a character. I stand by the list. Look, look, this isn't this this. Anyone can make a list and just say, you know, these are 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 the other characters with top billing. I'm digging deep into the psychology of the show, <laughs> and Jim is dead last, just below Robert California, who is so weird. I just couldn't believe. Oh, okay, it. I'm gonna do a little behind a little inside baseball behind the scenes in the in the studio today. Joining us because he just started working here at Relevant this week. Welcome to the show, new Tyler, Tyler Daswick. Thank you so much. Uh, wow. <laughs> I, I am assuming, now I don't know this for a fact, I don't know how affectionate or knowledgeable you are about the office, but mm. do you have an opinion and will you please put Jesse in his place? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple, uh, there's two different philosophies at okay. work here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you know, if we want to, if we want to keep this sports metaphor going. Yes. 
right? Kyle Korver is not the most important player on the Cavs. Right. I love it. Now, as in sports, you've got the old guard. Yeah. Cameron. Yeah. He's going going by the eye test. <laughs> the eye test. Going I like by the it. eye test. That's right. Whereas, so you're su- Jesse oh. kind of taking more more advanced metric. That's approach. right. You're saying he's moneyballing this? He's moneyballing the office. Oh, Let me right. new Tyler. First of all, we're not even going to talk about Thank World you, Tyler. Tyler. He's by just the way. not a part of it anymore. Yeah. Like, <laughs> old Tyler is now that we franked him. Poof, he's gone. We franked yeah. him right. two, year, two years Tyler, later. Tyler, that is a perfect is analogy at. because like I no, said, no, no, my, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Jesse. He's not in your corner yet. So see those A's rolled it rolled off rolled off a nice little win streak. That's cute. That's cute. I'm the but, Theo Epstein of, of ranking but, office <laughs> characters, Tyler, is what you're saying. But I'm just thinking, you know, yeah. new member of the staff here right. coming in. Right. Theo Epstein, you know, fine. He had his moment. He had his moment. Yeah. But I, I I'm I'm looking at the old leadership right now. Uh-huh. Well, I'm looking right into his eyes. Yeah, <laughs> you are. He is, actually. Wow. He is. I'm gonna read I'm gonna quick I'm not gonna do any explanation, oh. but just for okay. people's context, okay? Ready? Creed Michael Dwight. Aaron, mm. Kelly, Daryl, Kevin, <laughs> oh. Toby, Meredith, Oscar, Pam, Todd Packer, Mose, Stanley, Phyllis, Jan, Andy, Gabe, Ryan, Joe, Karen, Charles, Angela, Robert, California, Jim. That's the I was going to say, I have no idea what anyone I mean, is talking honestly, about right now. I, I really? disagree with you. I don't, that, I don't that watch that sports, so I don't thank, get any of the analogies, and I've yeah. never watched The Office. Really? No. Here's, you know what? Here's a way you're to fine. This down. Yeah. You're fine. Just, you're, just <laughs> stick with what's happening now. You don't need to. <laughs> oh my god. Here's here's a way to break this down for the okay. uninitiated. Okay. Yes. All right. Cameron has taken this from a pure watch the show <laughs> enjoyability standpoint. Yeah. yeah. Who's yeah. The, old it's affecting my experience yeah. the most uh-huh. as a viewer. Old school. Yeah. Whereas Jesse, for some sick reason, <laughs> is is looking at this on a weird laughs per minute <laughs> per second. He's doing a PR. He's We're, doing a PR. He's he bringing, can't even think about yeah, what he players enjoys. Players above or place right. is what I'm he's, doing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he's bringing math into a workplace <laughs> sitcom <laughs> on NBC. Yeah, right. And, and if you wanted to do that, why is Moe's, I don't think he's even in your top 10, where he might have the highest oh. ratio of viewer laughs per moment of oh. screen time. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, so just okay, a lot but, of to, to be fair, I'd like to address the most dilemma, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because this, I thought about it a lot. He falls exactly in the middle. He is number 13, okay? <laughs> it's no a sense. list of 26 characters in Moses, Cousin Moses 13. I here here's what I here's what I said. Here's why I got him so low. This is why he's 13 and not in the top five. I'm listening. Because he is funnier off screen than he is on. He is funnier when Dwight is referencing his cousin than when he's actually on the show, which is for a few fleeting moments, only a handful of times. But like when Bo says when when Dwight says, Oh, Mo Mo's doesn't uh Mo's still screams in his sleep because of what happened during the storm. I feel like that's a funnier line when you don't <laughs> Don't see him. That brought him down a notch. I thought about all this, Tyler. I thought you're, about it. You know what you're describing is you're describing a locker room veteran, right? Mm-hmm. Now I'm a fan of the Phoenix Suns, terrible garbage basketball yeah. team, but key member of the Suns roster. We still need that savvy veteran, yeah, who's going to yeah. sit in the locker room and school the young guys. Yeah, <laughs> you know he's not going to appear yeah. in the game, right? It's not like not like most is right. going to appear on screen, but, but he's throughout yeah. the game. Exactly, right. his ah. presence is felt. My, my I issue, right. something. My issue is my value. when I talk to people about the office, they always like, well, you know, it was great. And then it, it just kind of after Michael left, yeah. it fell yeah. apart. It wasn't yeah, okay. it won the same show, one good. So I'm like, I think everybody agrees with that. He's your LeBron. He's your most important player because if you take that one player off, last year when LeBron didn't play for the Cavs, you still had Kyrie, you still had Kevin Love, you had two All Stars and the rest of the roster, but no LeBron. The Cavs were zero and eight. Wow. When you take Michael Scott off. The office. Look what happened that last season. They're zero and twelve. Yeah. Hey, look, listen. Oh, it's a, it's it's a, it's a list that people can choose to debate. They'll be wrong, but they can choose to debate. <laughs> and that's why I threw it out to the. Well, that's the beauty world. of the internet. All right. That's well, that's a good be- that's a good intro to our uh, new Tyler. Uh, which, yeah. uh, thanks for uh, thanks. setting Jesse Ho- straight. Hoping to not be new Tyler forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would start looking for another Tyler. Then we were right. trying <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, yesterday uh, we were. 
an editorial <laughs> meeting with Tyler. with Tyler Huckabee. <laughs> Tyler the third. Tyler Huckabee is on staff still, you know, and so we were trying to figure out because Tyler, New, Tyler Daswick and Tyler Huckabee were in the same meeting. Oh boy. And we were trying to like, how do we refer to each other? So we just, just settled on Grandpa Tyler. And yeah. uh, he was yeah. not happy with that. Yeah, Tyler and Grandpa Tyler. E- 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 either way, before I jump into my slice, the reason I brought up the office thing, because <laughs> I was like, Scott, what's your slice, Eddie? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. No, either uh, way, before uh, we start Michael slices. Scott once pitched a movie about a world leader, like our preposterous uh, um, uh, House of Cards scenario, his pitch, which he said he started crying when he thought of, was <laughs> he had no arms and no legs. He couldn't <laughs> see, speak, or hear. This is how he led a nation. That's Michael Scott's ultimate inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so let's do my actual slice. I'll keep it kind of quick. Uh, okay, so it, it's it's coming to the time of year where we do year end lists. I love year end lists, um, and you know a lot of them are done very. A lot of them are just people's opinions, which I hate. When I see a list, I want it to be undebatable matter of fact using numbers and things to come up with undebatable lists of pop culture stuff that's what twitter did with their list of the most retweeted tweets of the year uh some of them are are pretty uh, you know inspiring uh, a tweet about someone tweeting out a suicide hotline um that uh you know raised a lot of awareness about people who need help was retweeted more than 600,000 times a guy saying that uh, he's going to donate six pounds of dog food to Houston for every retweet uh, he got 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 retweeted over six hundred thousand times. Um, wow! It's uh, President Obama's uh, final tweet of his presidency. It's been an honor to serve you. You made me a better leader and a better man over six hundred thousand times. Um, uh, another tweet about raising money for the the victims of the Houston hurricane. Uh, which in which an organization pledged to give money for every retweet got over a million. But there was one that stood out. The coming in second place was a tweet that received 1.7 million tweets. And it was the one I think we talked about on the show before. Um, it was featured an image of President Obama looking at a, a diverse group of children in a window of a school. And he wrote and he used the quote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin. Or his incredible. background or his religion. A beautiful, a beautiful tweet. Got 1.7. But one was far and away. So number, so number two got 1.7 million retweets. Number one got 3.6 million. Far and away, the most retweeted tweet of 2017. Can anyone guess? I know. What I that I tweet have a guess. was. Wendy's Wind, Nugget Kid. Wendy's Nugget Kid beat President Obama in wow. his message for world Are you peace. Serious? Yeah, that's wow. great. Carter Wilkerson tweeted, yo, Wendy's, how many retweets for a year of free nuggets? Uh, Wendy's replied, 18 million, to which he said, consider it done. This is in a direct message exchange, which he he then tweeted an image of this. And the retweet that actually got the retweet was the image of this cut back and forth between Wendy's and all capitals, Carter Wilson tweeting, Help me, please. A man needs his nugs. <laughs> that was the most retweeted tweet of 2017. Oh <laughs> at some point, there's going to be America. like a cultural anthropologist who looks back at, at, at what social media can tell us about the psychology of our modern, modern times of 2017 <laughs> and see this as far and away more popular than any message about peace or helping people and right. really come up with some interesting conclusions about what our society values. I do think it's interesting, though. I mean, I I mean, take the intellectual route, looking back in history when they look at the how did social media affect <laughs> or reveal the American psyche or whatever. Yeah. The fact of crowdsourcing. We mm-hmm. never had the opportunity to crowdsource anything before. Now, all of a sudden, it's pretty like, democratic. Anything you're passionate about, anything you want help with or whatever, you can literally just post and it could go and yeah. it could happen. And like it yeah. gives people yeah. who didn't have access to platforms or power or influence the ability to do this and this kid could have a lifetime of free nugs. Very yeah. true. You know, I, I got to say too, in truth about that tweet, I loved it because, and I don't think like you could make the case that, Oh, this just talks about America and how dumb we are. So, but I don't think it's that. I think it's just, we needed something that was just silly and funny. Yeah, trivial. There is yeah. a, there's a lot of seriousness this year. Yeah. I wonder if people, I wonder if cult- cultural anthropologists of the future will wonder if like nugs had medicinal powers or something. Cause mm. they were so important. 
I think nugs will be a primary food staple <laughs> for many generations. I, so. say, yeah. I, don't, I don't see nugs going <laughs> really yeah, very right Seriously, yeah. that's, the, that's the reason. It they're a very so efficient uh, food. It's a little pocket-sized protein. I will yeah, never say the word nugget Wendy's. again. No, nugs is the <laughs> best way to say it. A man needs his nugs. <laughs> he <laughs> does. Nugget is too long a word for such a <laughs> tiny little food. <laughs> that's what that's it, right. It, the word it, matches the food now. Yeah. All right, what do you have, Eddie? Well, I would like to talk about um, just a, a modern-day hero, a U.S. Army medic. His name is Alex Bowen, and uh, I love this guy. Just so everybody knows, this is we're not playing the T.D. Jakes documentary clip again. This is Eddie's uh, no, this slice. Is <laughs> Eddie's, yeah, <laughs> grizzly voice. So Alex Bowen, apparently, U.S. Army medic, was having uh, quite a night. And in the middle of the night, it would appear as though he had, you know, maybe been having some root beer or something, went out, and he headed to, of course, where else are you going to go? Waffle House. So he walks into the Waffle House at, I forget what time it is. Oh, it was like 3 a.m.? Yeah, he walks into the Waffle House, and he sees the entire staff asleep. So the staff at this Waffle House, and there's a picture of it. So the Waffle House was empty. Right. There's nobody in the Waffle House. It's 3 a.m. He and a buddy have really tied one on. He heads into the Waffle House, yeah. and all the employees are asleep. <laughs> and I get it, right? These are hard jobs. They've been working a long day. I, and he takes he starts Instagramming and taking pictures of this entire experience. So he he's standing at the counter waiting for anyone to come and serve him. And after about 10 minutes, he and his friends start to get suspicious, and they take a peek behind, and they look, and they see this just young woman <laughs> with <laughs> just asleep. And, and they're like, okay. So what does Alex decide to do? Alex hops over the counter. And makes his own little snack. Oh, wow. So Alex, oh. he begins to make himself a, what did he, oh, he took pictures of himself frying bacon, <laughs> to making this entire sandwich. He created for himself a Texas bacon cheese steak melt, and he recorded each step of it. Now, each step of it, as you can see in some of the pictures, is like him taking a 3 a.m. super drunk selfie in front of him making it. So he jumps over. He makes his own entire meal. He then scrapes and cleans the grill and leaves, and no one knew he was there. Let me just talk about this <laughs> <laughs> on a few levels. I mean, there was, a, there, there was a curb your enthusiasm this year where, like, they were waiting for the food, the food was up in the window, and they were, and there was like, well, I, the server doesn't see it, I see our food, I'll just go get it. And it was a whole episode about, you know, you don't do that. Yeah. But, like, I, we've all, I've been tempted to do that. Yeah. Like, I, I see my food. I'm hungry. I, I'm. I can just do it myself. I don't need to wait for them. Right. So I, you know, get a refill yourself, or like, I mean, like I, right. I've seen. The, you know, I need a ketchup bottle. I know where the little server stand is. Right. I'll go get my own ketchup bottle. I'm gonna have to sit there and wait. Yeah. And this guy's yeah. a U.S. Army medic, an army of one. He knows how to be resourceful <laughs> <laughs> and thoughtful. He right. jumps the counter. Now, what they didn't say is, did he pay? That's what I was gonna ask. It doesn't say he, in the he, article. My you know, hope is that he, he paid. came. He came back later and paid. Oh, good. So yeah. Waffle House kind of replied and they were like, while we appreciate his resourcefulness, we also would ask that, you know, customers not jump the counter and cook their own food. And yeah. the district manager called and apologized to him for having everyone be asleep. They also offered but, him a job as a cook and they kind of cryptically put, we may be hiring at that location. <laughs> so, yeah. Does oh, she so. still have a job? They did not say. But no, I, no, she, I, she got suspended for a week. I don't think Poor she girl. Does. Yeah. Poor girl. Anyway, uh, this guy's a hero and I just wanted to bring him to your attention because <laughs> we all need a little bit of good news. And Alex, you are our good news. That is pretty. Epic. I got. I got. A, I got a fast food etiquette question since we're on the topic. Uh, I know. I know. I know. We, we got to move along here. But like, okay, you're at. We always let's have say, time for this. You're at one of these establishments, right? And it's a very long line at the register. You finally got. You got your food. You took a seat, and you need like a condiment that's behind the counter. Right. Yeah. You yeah. Know, get Chick Fil A. Like, it's one of these places that don't <laughs> have. Do you just walk up to the? Do you yeah. cut the line yeah. and just ask the the person? Hundred percent. You you saddle yes. right up. You get you get eye contact. You're like, yeah, I just need a sauce. Can I get a sauce? You do not stand in line. Why do you stand in line? Of- That's side counter. Because, it's because like everyone's sidebar. thinking you're cutting. Everyone's like, hey, hey, hey it's back there, pal. No, no. I need no, my no, food no, no. too. You go to the side. Uh, Eddie's right. Yeah, side you go to the side of the counter in some respect, and then just kind of flag them down. Yeah, you're yeah. on a request. And, a side you're not in a you're not there. in a register line. You go no, no. You, you go it's somewhere. It's a touchy else. thing. It's a face. If it's the lunch rush, you're going to get some dirty looks. Once you've paid, you have jurisdiction over the entire restaurant for the duration of you could hop the counter and make yourself something else yeah whatever you need to do you go (laughs) get an extra pickle pack go get it help yourself you've already paid well done what do you have Andre okay my story is a story about an activist this man what a build up (laughs) pastor David Grisham okay self-described Christian evangelist 
Self-described. Really? <laughs> Let me stop you there. Yeah. Yeah. When Taunt- someone says they're an apostle, you're like, oh, good. Taunted <laughs> children and their parents who were waiting to meet Chris Kringle at a Santa Claus house in North Pole, Alaska. There's a video of this on the Huffington. Wait, wait, wait. North Pole, Alaska. Yeah. Oh, wow. And this is not a mall Santa. This is. They made like this is a special thing. Yeah, there was a lot that you said in that. In a Santa Claus house? I Uh, assumed that was a weird word for a mall, but that's like. It's some kind of store or whatever. And (laughs) this guy walks in so that he can ruin these young people's childhood by telling them that Santa Claus is not real. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the reason for the season. So basically the street evangelist in front of every concert I've ever been to telling us that we're all going to hell because we're going to a secular concert or something like that. That that was true. Except he walked in and decided to tell all the kids that were there and they're in front of their parents that Santa Claus is not real, Mm -hmm. which I thought about this for a while. Like what possesses a person to like get up out of bed and go down to the store conviction, just for this message. What? Addiction? Is a no, conviction. Conviction, conviction. Yeah. 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 Addiction like, could have worked as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Addicted to Jesus, A to J. Yeah. <laughs> Carmen <laughs> and DC Talk taught mm, us that in the early 90s. I see that <laughs> hand in the back. <laughs> Amen. Of all the uh, important things in the world to go out and protest, this is... This I'll is say what? I'll say this. I'll be the contrarian here. I can see the disdain you guys are talking about for the self-described evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cut of this guy's jib. He's the reason. I proclaim it. I don't care the age of the hearer. It is it is the message. You know, I've gone to various malls. He's the reason, and we got a fraud up there. <laughs> He's not the real Santa. I've been removed. I've been Santa. roughed up. Uh, but you know, it's um, <laughs> go into all the world. It's the migrate. Yeah, why can't so. Christians just let people? You know, just uh, let worship children. Santa. Just worship him. No, Who cares? Just Do worship. Your deal. Not say that. We're just. Well, but I mean, there's no harm in your <laughs> I, children. I feel like I haven't heard the general disdain for Santa though from Christian. Like that's not a typical Christian, oh, even a Christian weirdo thing, right? No, you haven't heard that. You haven't no, I heard thought people were generally fine. You with haven't Santa. heard people say things like Santa's just Satan re- with the letters rearranged and stuff like that. But he was ba- he's based that. on no. Saint no. Nicholas, a Christian saint. Yes. Right. Do you guys believe in Santa? I'll say this. If Satan Satan is basically uh, Santa. I'm not that afraid of Satan anymore because he kind of right. sounds cool because right. he's right. 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 So I'm not right. saying to be into Satan, but I'm saying if he is Santa, right. then man, he's got a right. bad rap with Christians right. because actually this dude's <laughs> kind of all right. I mean, I, I mean, I leave three cookies. Satan can't even finish three cookies. Oh he leaves crumbles. God. Who cares? This guy isn't that tough. <laughs> right? How hard is it to finish three normal sugar cookies? <laughs> right? Oh, so what happened? Did you get arrested? Well, How did well, it make the news? Okay, like, who, who? It's it's on Huffington Post, and I'm watching this video, and I'm going, why is every everyone just kind of ignores him? Like, okay. there are a couple there are a couple store attendants that come over and ask him to leave very nicely, but I'm sitting here wondering, like, why are no parents like turning around and saying, "Hey, man, get out of here," you know? Yeah. Like, our kids are listening to you. Everyone just kind of like freezes. Yeah. And just well, it's goes, one of those things is I can't believe this is happening. I, yeah. You know, everybody like, freezes. I could see that. Yeah. But I've seen videos of this happen before, and usually the parents will try and intervene and stop really? the guy. Yeah. I just really can't believe Santa is a. I really never never heard the pushback. I mean, I get, okay. I mean, I get uh, Christians of a certain generation being dismayed at the commercialism of the holiday, the lack of, you know, the religious importance of what's being celebrated and the commercialization, you know, just like, you know, we're all singing jingle bells and winter wonderland songs and not Jesus songs and the hymns. Yeah. And the, I get it. You know, we don't want to lose the true meaning and whatever. And, and, and frankly, as a parent, I'm very aware of, trying to, you know, keep the magic of, of Christmas alive for my child, but yeah. also instill like the real kind of mm-hmm. Christian heritage and what, what, what we're, we're, what we're remembering here. But, uh, you're not heading down to millennia and going, that's screaming. what I'm saying. <laughs> why can't we leave? Why can't it be a both? And why does it have to be either or is my only question. And come on, Christians, calm down. This that's is, what I'm saying. I'll, say, I'll say this. I'll tell you why. Because one day the wheat will be separated from the chaff. And the people who didn't go in there and warn those four children about, you know, Satan slash Santa, yeah. who, like I said, not a bad dude when you really think about it. Either way, 
Either way, I got to follow my heart here. Um, <laughs> I, 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 here's the thing. I err on the safe side. And if I feel like the right thing to do is scream at a bunch of kids, I scream at them all the time. <laughs> that is so, true. I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area. It's a gray <laughs> area, Cameron. That's what, that's what it, it comes down to. All right. That'll do it for Slices. <laughs> Stay tuned. Up next, Drake joins us. I can never run. 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 I can never change. You're listening to Lawrence Rothman. The song is Stand By. Well, this week's featured performance is brought to you by Warby Parker, a new concept in eyewear founded with a rebellious spirit and a lofty goal to create boutique quality eyewear at a revolutionary price point. I'm glad you're bringing them up. We need to talk about Warby Parker. Yes, we do. Available exclusively through Warby Parker's website and retail stores. Glasses start at just $95, including the prescription lenses. And uh, it's eyewear with a purpose. Almost a billion people worldwide lack access to glasses. And for every pair of glasses that Warby Parker sells, they bring vision to somebody in need. The great thing about Warby Parker is they have a free home try-on program. You can order five pairs of glasses and try them on for five days with no obligation to buy. It ships free, includes a, a prepaid return shipping envelope. Just go to warbyparker.com slash relevant to order your free home try-ons today. If you have an iPhone X, uh, make sure to download Warby Parker's app where you can use their brand new feature, Find Your Fit. So Find Your Fit uses the iPhone X's true depth camera to map and measure key facial features. Using these measurements, Find Your Fit recommends approximately 12 Warby Parker frames that are likely to be the f- best fit for your face. The process is seamless and takes only a few seconds. It's super cool. I have been a Warby Parker customer for years, like long before they sponsored the show. I, I, I have a ton of Warby it. Parkers. Their home try-on thing is a game changer. I mean, honestly, it's a seamless experience and it's affordable glasses. And then they give a pair to someone in need. It's just a great company. Um, great style, great oh. purpose, great quality. Love them. Again, head to warbyparker.com slash relevant to order your free home try-on pairs today. Cody Carnes is a singer, songwriter, and worship leader that blurs the line between traditional praise and worship and progressive kind of anthemic rock. He recently stopped by the Relevant Studios for an exclusive live performance playing songs off his new album, which is called The Darker the Night, The Brighter the Morning, as well as a sit-down interview. So that's what you're about to experience. We're going to do one of his uh, in-studio performances. Uh, We'll come back, talk to him, and then we'll hear another track from from, uh, Cody. And you breakers wash over me. Deep calls to deep in the mysteries. I don't want to wait a moment more. You're here.
was Cody Carnes. Make sure to check out his new album, The Darker the Night, The Brighter the Morning. When I need small reminder When my legs cannot find the road When I'm heavy with my burden So my bed is tired and bold All these questions Listening to the Flying Stars of Brooklyn, New York. The song is "My God Has a Telephone." When uh, Cody Garns uh, came through the studio, uh, Andre, you actually got the chance to uh, talk to him, huh? Yeah, I did. And he is, first off, just a really great guy. Like, really great energy coming into the studio. And you know, did I, you ask him about being married to Carrie Job? I I did. A yeah, little bit. It's Carrie Job's uh, husband. I, I, I didn't want to make a huge deal out of it and like make the interview entirely about that, but <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I did ask him. You know, what is it like? Um, you know, two worship leaders, like, because they're like the the dream power couple of every Christian college student, right? Like every you know worship leader marries a worship leader and they just worship God all the time in their house and stuff like that. And well, I mean, I saw. I was on the. Uh, I was at the. Uh, Outcry tour or something like that, mm-hmm. and and Cody performed, and then Carrie came out, yeah. and then Carrie performed, and it was a whole thing. And they do a duet on his album that is actually like really good. Like I don't I don't listen to a lot of worship music anymore, just you know when I'm not at church. Um, but I did listen. Why to is that? Let's dig into that, <laughs> dude. I don't I don't either. I've kind of embraced this Santa Satan thing. It's a lot of confusion right now, and I'm not into worshiping one deity until I figure this. Until I crack this nut, I'll say that. The actually the duet that he has with Carrie is like super interesting. I thought that I was listening to like M eighty three or you know something like James Blake inspired or something. I mean it's not that out there, but right, right. you can tell that like he's listening to all of these other artists and other sounds that are going on, and he's letting it come through in his music. That's it's awesome. Really interesting and really cool. Here it is part of Andre's conversation with Cody Carnes. I wanted to mention my favorite song of the singles that you've released. Yeah, um, is "Till the End of Time." Yeah, yeah, I, uh, for a few reasons. First yeah. off, the studio version is so interesting musically, mm-hmm. like yeah. this, the synthesizers and the groove and all the kind of stuff. Yeah, and I'm I'm listening, and you know, a common criticism of Christian music is yeah. that you know it's predictable, it's right. formulaic, it's right. you know, but. That that just sonically, it's so interesting and so and it. also, I mean, carries on it, yeah. you know. And I just thought, but it's funny, like maybe the first half of the song, I'm thinking, so is this like a duet? Like, are they singing to each other? You yeah, know, like there's, right. this, <laughs> there's this interesting like yeah. connection of like you two being bride and groom right. singing to one another. Yeah, and. I don't know. So, and I wonder, was that intentional? You know, like the, the Bible talks about how 
you know, the bride of Christ and yeah. Jesus and the church. And I mean, it's definitely, we're definitely not singing to each other. It's not yeah. intentional, but it does have that. I think people can liken it. it. I mean, it's a pop song, so people can kind of liken it. Normally when you hear pop music, you, you hear songs about love and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I loved about this album is that I wanted to take all of those sounds and all of, all of that pop vibe that I love mm -hmm and make a worship album with it. Yeah. I'm like, why not? Why Why does that sound or why does that like level of excellence in production, why does it have to be limited to pop? Why can't we bring it into uh, worship music? Why can't, and it's it's been amazing because I've seen people connect with it that maybe don't connect with some worship music. Mm -hmm. And I love worship music. So yeah. I'm, I'm a fan, I, I'm not a critic whatsoever. But uh, but I just felt that this is the sound that God put in my heart to, to, to put out. Yeah. The sound that God put in my heart to make for whatever reason, you know, I felt like I'm called to this time right now. And there's all these reasons that I don't, I don't even understand yet why God said, I need you to create this. I need you to make this sound in the earth. And it's been fun to just, in these first couple months, I'm only two months in, you know, three months in, and, but it's been fun to watch people be drawn to it that, mm. that in that way of like, man, I've never, I've never liked this kind of music, but I love this. And yeah. I've never been to worship experience, but I want to come see you live. And I want to, I, I pretty much, I want you to show me what that's like, you know? So I love the, 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 the way that it's drawing new people in yeah. and um, it's, it's so exciting. And I, I just made an album that, that sounded like what I wanted <laughs> music to sound like, yeah. you know? All my favorite types of music are all kind of just in this melting pot yeah. in my album, um, but I'm also a worship leader, and I, I love leading people to Jesus. I mm. love singing about Jesus and singing to Jesus. And so, man, I just, that's, that's a, it's, it's a dream, really, for me to just kind of marry all those things together. Yeah, I mean, you're pulling things that are familiar to people on several different levels. Yeah. You know, not just musically, but people, uh, we all, especially in American culture, we have this relationship with love and, yeah. you know, for it to sound like a pop song, to sound yeah. like a love song, and then, but the things that you also are bringing in, like, especially in the second half of the song where the lyrics go, like, yeah. it's, it's very clear, like, what you're singing about yeah. is, that's really cool. For sure. So while we're talking about what you sound like, has anyone ever told you that you sound like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? No. You've never gotten that No, are you before. serious? I'm dead serious. <laughs> no. what do you, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked me that's that a, question. That's a, that's a massive compliment. I don't know what you mean by that. But you do. You do sound like, because the title of the album is... The Darker the Night, The Brighter the Morning, yeah. Right, and Dr. King talks about how okay. only in the darkest of night yes. can we see the stars. Yes. And, um... You know, I've been reading through Dr. King's work lately, um, very recently, and you know, we're familiar with a couple of his speeches, but if you ever yeah. like read like some of the, his sermons, yeah. the hope that Dr. King so had good. for racial justice yeah. and uh, for solidarity and justice and all that kind of stuff was, yeah. it's challenging, right. you know, not, not just the truth that he speaks about the nature of our country, but you know, that optimism. Sometimes you, yeah. I look at it and I go, how could yeah. you ever? And your t the title of your album, yeah. you know, has that really strong, confident mm -hmm. hope. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, you know, where does, where does that hope come from for yeah. you? Yeah. And, and where can people get some of that? Yeah, I mean, I, it really comes from just, I've, I've lived a life thus far just seeing Jesus do miraculous things, seeing Jesus do things in really impossible situations. We, we just walked through an, an impossible situation, what it seemed impossible in our family. We just, we lost uh, a, a little niece and wow. man, it just, it crushed our family. It's what Carrie's album, The Garden is about. It's, it's really that and, and, and I've just seen just a lot of scenarios in my life. I grew up in a, a single parent home. I grew up, you know, uh, really in a place where I, I should have ended up really messed up. I should have, it, it, the, the normal path for me would have been to just be on drugs or just be messed up or something like that. And I, I watched God just along, all along my life just step in and do impossible things. And it really just kind of built this hope in me to go, okay. And then when I look at the Word of God, I, I look at like all the stories in the Old Testament when, when there's an army of 300 against an army of 30,000. And the army of 300 is God's army. It's God's people. It's the people that God are with. And you watch God do these like 
crazy things where the army of 300 somehow wins because God's on their side. Um, you watch God do crazy things in Acts 16. Paul and Silas are in prison and they get beaten up and they get thrown into prison. They're chained to a wall. They start singing hymns to God and praying to God. God brings an earthquake and sets them free, mm. sets every prisoner around them free. And so the whole, the whole Bible, I mean, you look at the, the cross and the resurrection impossible situation, God intervenes, God does what only God can do. And so I have to know that if I see an impossible situation in my life, if we see an impossible situation in our country, um, anywhere we see impossible situations, that, that we turn to God, we ask God to intervene, that's what God does. Yeah. You know, I actually have a line in one of my songs, a song called Full of Faith on the, mm. on the record. And I have a line, the second verse says, you love the impossible things because they lead the way to miracles. Mm. So I'm looking doubt in the face, you have to bow to Christ my hope. So really we can hope in Jesus and, and um, I've just seen it. I've yeah. just seen it in my life in so many scenarios and I see it all through the word of God. Yeah. And, and I just feel this, I feel this hope, uh, I feel this responsibility really to make music that can help people help people, remind people of that, that Jesus is the only hope, Jesus is the only answer. Yeah. And you know, uh, this is just my opinion, but I, I think it's possible that, that some things may be, some, there's some things that we can find hope in that aren't of God. There's some things that, that people can find their hope in. They can find, some people can find hope in government. Some people can find hope in leadership and they can find this kind of peace and this hope and this security in things that really, that, that, that aren't, aren't God. And, and it's possible that, that some of those things are being eliminated so that Jesus is the only one left standing. Mm. That really Jesus is the only one that we can put our hope in. Jesus is the only one that's, that's always gracious, always kind, always full of love, uh, you know, isn't full of any sort of hate, isn't, isn't full of any sort of bigotry or any, anything that, that we see going on. Jesus is the one that's the opposite of all that, that, that we can turn to, we can run to, we can find our peace in. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, I, it is a very interesting time. And I mean, that's a massive compliment to be, you know, and, I, and, and um, but I, I really do believe that, that we're going to see some, some amazing things that cannot be denied, that Jesus is on the throne in yeah. control. We're already seeing them, you know, we're seeing them in, in all sorts of ways. And I believe it's only going to get stronger. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm frankly, I'm excited about it. It's a crazy time. Yeah. But I think there's no better time for, for the church to rise up and just love and just yeah. be the hope to, to the world. So yeah. it's good. Yeah, I mean, I, no one could deny that we live in some crazy times. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a lot of occasion for fear yeah. and outrage. And, you know, no matter what side of the fence or conversation you're on, like, yeah. that we're just surrounded by it. And it can be really difficult for people to stay hopeful. And yeah. so I love that. When you start talking about this, you start talking about all of these stories in the Bible, mm -hmm. like in the, in the Word of God, yeah. that are like past behavior is indicative of future yeah. behavior. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that, that to say like God intervenes, we know because I've seen God do this. Yeah. I've, I've heard of these stories, I've read these stories, I believe these stories, and I've seen God do it in my own life, I hear yeah. you saying, and that's, that's really beautiful. And I, I wonder for people who do, you know, look at look at the news and they might find themselves in despair, right? Mm -hmm. Like you talk about coming to Jesus, you know, what, how do you think that Jesus might answer, you know, the, the strife and division and all that that we see yeah. around us? I mean, I, to me, it's, it's, it's not, it's the opposite of the heart of God. It's the heart of God is, is love and unity and, and you know, I, 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 I don't know how Jesus would answer it, honestly. That's I, don't, fair. I, don't, I don't know what Jesus would say, <laughs> but I do know that, that, that God is love, and I do know, I mean, Jesus offers hope. Jesus says that, that even while we, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he came into a situation and offered up his life. And I think that that's the thing that we have to do as, as the church, is we have, to, we have to offer ourselves, we have to serve people. Mm. And, and there's, this, there's been this epidemic in the church where we, we're so quick to criticize mm. and so quick to judge uh -huh. and, and so quick to say, well, it's not my problem or it's not. And that's the opposite of what Jesus did. Mm. Jesus came into a world like that and said, I'm, 
I'm going to serve you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love. I'm going to I'm going to offer my life up for you. And I think that's what he would do now. I think what he's already done is is what's still being Hmm. we're still living in what Jesus has already done, you know, and it's. And so I think as a church and I I see it turning, which I I see it changing. I, I see the church becoming aware of, of themselves and b- becoming aware of ourselves on a part of that, mm-hmm. of just realizing like, wow, we haven't really been that kind, you know? <laughs> we ha- we've been pretty judgmental. We've been kind of pretty much in our own little circles and man, we should just reach out, go beyond, and we should we should go beyond the four walls of the church and, and start to build relationship with people mm-hmm. and start to love people and, and extend the grace that's been extended to us, you know? And, and so I, I feel like that's turning and I feel like that that's really the way that Jesus is gonna is going to come through in all this is the church. The church is the answer, mm. and 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 so we have to we have to love people. We have to accept. We have to we have to stand on the truth, not let the truth waver. Of course, um, but there's Jesus did truth and love a hundred percent of yeah. both. He did this truth and love tandem, and I think just as we ask, I ask Jesus all the time, help me to know how to do that. Help me to know how to be full truth and full love and grace. And, and that's, that's, that's the mission that I'm on with every person in my life. That was Cody Carnes. Stay tuned up next, Drake. The song is Heartbeat. Well, this week's feature performance is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. HelloFresh is convenient. You can choose a delivery day that works best for your busy schedule, and you can actually pause the account even for weeks at a time when you're out of town. I'll tell you, I take advantage of that feature. I, uh, I, I just got another box um, Monday and was cooking HelloFresh last night. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm I'm in. But I also <laughs> can look at my schedule and go, well, I'm traveling next week. Not going to be able to do it. So I just get it on the app and pause it. And it's no problem. Better than holding it via the post office because then it would all just be sitting at the post mushy. office. It'd be mushy. Right. You don't want to. Yeah, no, no. You got to have it fresh. Hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Hello Fresh offers a wide variety of chef curated recipes that change weekly. You have three plans to choose from. Classic, my favorite. Veggie. Eddie's favorite, and family. And right now, HelloFresh is uh, offering a special deal for relevant podcast listeners. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com slash relevant and enter offer code relevant30, 30s for the $30 off. Um, You'll like it. It's delicious. Cohen, and Cohen likes cooking with me. He thinks he's going to uh, be on Master Chef Junior one day because I had him chop cool. the tomatoes last night. <laughs> There's not a compelling reason why he wouldn't be. Yeah, I know. I mean, Put great. your mind to it, buddy. Yeah. I mean, if if a, if a medic can cook his own Waffle House meal, I believe in your culinary potential as well. That's what I told him. That's their new slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, fresh. Hello, fresh. If a medic can cook his own meal, we can get Cameron to figure out a good dinner. Come along. Hey, when Cody Carnes came through the studio, he performed a couple of songs for us. Now, as if you've been listening to the show, you know that we're just moved locations. Yeah. We were building out new sets and studios in downtown Orlando. We are uh, recording in temporary aesthetics, I would yeah. say. Uh, Cody came in with this whole band, uh, and, and so we we set we it was it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so, but we wanted to film it. So we Why have the you? space. Let's film it. And the performance was awesome. Well, performing Hold It All. Here is Cody Carnes. Over my 
That was Cody Carnes. Hey, if you want to see the videos of these performances, make sure to go check out the relevant YouTube channel. Stay tuned. Up next is your feedback. Listening to tennis. The song is I Miss That Feeling. Okay, it's time for your feedback. Do we have any corrections and apologies this week? I won't correct her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, last week, the question of the week, uh, we, we got uh, asking you about internet wormholes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesse uh, was telling us how he became very well versed in the flat earth turtle theory. That's right. Uh, which. We all know. I mean, we, we're yeah. still going with I, I, I went down a flat earth wormhole recently. I yeah. didn't get the whole turtle all the way down thing until okay. I looked at the picture of what yeah. a flat earther thinks the earth looks like, and yeah. I got the turtle thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jesse's known for, you know, being a uh, complete lunatic. A complete lunatic and the er- internet wormhole. Finding himself in internet wormholes pretty regularly. We wanted to know the best internet wormhole you've ever gone down. You guys hit us up on Twitter at Relevant Podcast, and you posted also on the podcast episode page at RelevantMagazine.com. Here are a few of our favorites. Well, Kelsey, Kelsey Mattis, I, I seriously could do a whole podcast about internet wormholes each episode because I love it so much. And Kelsey Mattis talked about one that I've gone deep, I've done a deep dive on. And she said, at the risk of sounding like a bunker-dwelling conspiracy theorist, I have spent far too much time researching MK Ultra to the point that she thought about CD, uh, sending a uh, Freedom of Information uh, request to the government for... Uh, do you guys know what in, in, MK Ultra is? I have is? no idea what you're no, talking about. Just about this is yeah. Andre listening to us talk about The Office. He <laughs> yes, has no exactly. clue. I have no <laughs> clue what you're talking about. <laughs> it, I also was, just love it, was, it was it a was, side note that we may not know what it is because he just assumes <laughs> like, oh, they all know. They're pretty... MK well, Ultra. Yeah, da, right. da, da, da. It was the the CIA's covert uh, mind control program that it ran for like 50 years trying to figure out if it could control people's minds and like um, do like uh, telekinetic things. Um, It was a super secretive program, but they ran it for decades. Wait, Uh, is it, uh, it, it existed for real? Yeah, it existed for real. There's a lot of no, no, no. It it really existed, and there's a lot of uh, 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 secrecy around it. Um, One of the people there's a there's a great book by uh, the journalist John Ronson, who's kind of done a deep dive into this and a lot of conspiracy theories. If anyone's interested, I got to tell you, one of my unintended favorite parts of this entire question is that I just realized, like, I just have to bring it up real quick, and then Jesse's gonna fully fill us in on every nuance of it because he knows all of these deep dives. I, <laughs> I do this. know all of them. I know you do. It's amazing. I have no, I have no, I have no uh, issue with that. Um, Greg <laughs> Kazowski said, "None uh, may none forget the parallel universe conspiracy surrounding those beloved children's books. Is it Berenstain Bears with an E or Berenstain? How does it work, Jesse? Berenstain or Berenstain? Be- just yeah. tell us." It, well, it, it's that one is a lot of people remember it spelled with an E when it's actually spelled with an A. And yeah. the common solution for that is that it's a collective false memory. A lot of like that. So for some reason, uh, m- a mass amount of people believe something that never happened. It's like a lot of people who believe they saw that Sinbad Genie movie when there was never one that ever existed. Uh, right. But the uh, the alternate theory is that in a parallel universe where there are only slight variations of our own, that it was actually spelled with an E, and at some point those parallel universes no longer became parallel, and they intersected. And people who lived in the universe with the E had now live in the universe with the A, and, and are pretty sure of that fact. That's where that conspiracy theory is. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Spencer uh, Gilliand said, I went down a pretty deep rabbit hole after listening to Jesse's infamous world's largest twins breakdown. 
Seriously, oh, yeah. how could I not research that? Oh, that I regret so nothing. That is a fascinating, <laughs> tragic story. But one of them did go down in a blazing glory. Can, can you give us a jump quick over recap? Niagara Falls. Can you please give us a quick recap of what happened to them? I don't care if we don't get to any more feedback. It's my favorite thing. Okay, do you guys do you guys remember? Do you guys do you guys remember getting the world's book, the Guinness Book of World Records when you were a kid? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah of course, oh, the best. Okay, the best so it, guys it, it's not like it is now. Now they're like a coffee table book with these big. Yeah. You know, yeah. images like back then it was like this little fat book and always yeah. and they had just like really it was almost like a weird like encyclopedia type of thing and people with like long fingernails it wasn't everyone setting any cool records it was mostly like human oddities and things on the last page it was always the world's largest twins riding two motorcycles that right. barely look like they can now, go down the road when we're saying large stages. we're not talking about height we are talking about width uh, they, yeah, and they, so these they are like just, 600 pound but they kind of owned it riding motorcycles so right. it was a yeah they were it was big, a stunning visual you're big one, yeah. one on, on, a, on an episode years ago I, that was recorded on the week of magazine deadline where I had not been sleeping very much <laughs> <laughs> they came up, and I had told Adam, who was on the show that day, just an interesting trivia fact, because one day I was just fascinated about who these guys were, and I read a lot about them. And one of them... Internet wormhole. Yeah. If one of them perished attempting to uh, basically jump over Niagara Falls on the motorcycle, which uh, there was no way he was going to make. That is so, so sad. No, no. It's so sad. No, no. It's it was so an sad. immediate, like the front tire got over the ledge and it was straight down from there. There was no, I don't think there was movement. I Either, there was, okay. Uh, I'm going to read another one. Dustin uh, recently spent a two hour journey into the world of Japanese game shows when YouTube suggested that I might enjoy a clip from the show called Slippery Stairs. <laughs> Thank you, YouTube. I did enjoy it very, very much. You, Hey, Dustin, you could have also seen that if you're on relevantmagazine.com when I posted the slice, slippery stairs should be an Olympic sport. Um, it's a fascinating <laughs> clip. Uh, I'm, I'm mad you didn't see it via slices first, but, uh, you know, I'm glad you at least came That's across That's hilarious. It. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more. If you want to find yourself in some internet wormholes, go look at the ones that our other listeners have found themselves in. Uh, it's funny. Can I throw uh, one more out there that people sure. need to go deep dive in? That's very weird. That I said, Avril, sure. that Why Avril Levine either retired or mysteriously vanished years ago, and a body oh, double has taken her place. That's a good one. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of compelling evidence on oh, that, on the that Avril Levine, Levine does not exist anymore, and it's her body double playing her life. Yeah. No it's way. Very, oh yeah. It, it's it, wild. It, 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 and people have, there's like websites dedicated to this. Oh my These goodness. are the kind of wormholes I'm talking about going. This on. is a Kevin Spacey uh, possibility. Yes. That's what could happen. Yeah. Just all of a sudden the guy that plays the, I don't know, the main <laughs> agent on shield, that guy. Yeah. Right. He's just, just Kevin Spacey and no one really says anything. Yeah, It's a Darren situation. You can't really yeah. Yeah. from bewitched. Right. It's Becky. New Becky. Yeah. yeah. New yeah. Becky. New right. Becky. New yes. Avril. Right. New Avril. Whose yeah. name is April. <laughs> All right, uh, that'll do it for last week's feedback. It's time for this week's <laughs> editorial question of the week. Hey. Well, okay, we know earlier in the in the show we thought the question of the week wrote itself, the Kevin Spacey thing. But you know what? Eddie ruined it for everybody by saying they're going to fast forward. And now that's actually what's going to happen. And what there's no fun in that anymore. And I got to also say, since that was recorded, if that ends up being how they do it, I would like a producer credit and I would like a <laughs> cut of the royalties because it feels and like, I'd like also a Netflix. Eddie, be quiet. If you turn him into a baby president, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. it would not be fair if I was not. I've got some ideas and by ideas, I mean some very saying, expensive mock intellectual property that I've written. It's, Turning him into a baby right. is a beautiful so, idea. So for this yeah, this week's question, <laughs> league, we want to shift mode uh, modes a little bit. Um, you know, we brought the slice earlier uh, about uh, the the pa the evangelist, the self described <laughs> Christian evangelist um, <laughs> who is who's making it his life's work to ruin. Oh, I'm sorry, educate the children about right. the real meaning of Christmas. We man. we think maybe <laughs> his methods leave a little bit to be desired. Um, <laughs> But, you know, a, a lot of us really do um, feel that tension this time of year yeah. that the Christmas, uh, the version of Christmas that's being kind of forced upon us by American culture yeah. and commercialism. The crush of Christmas. Yeah, yeah. is not not what it's about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and it's like trying to find that balance of rest and joy and being with family and also being yeah. generous and give back and, and, and not get lost and uh, not losing the real meaning in the yeah. midst of all of that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, how do we do it as believers, as Christians, how can we maybe chart a different course 
for this. Maybe we can like tilt the trajectory yeah. in a healthy way, unlike what self-described evangelists might be <laughs> trying to do. Yeah. So for this week's question of the week, we want to know maybe a tradition that you have or your favorite thing that you do to celebrate Christmas with intentionality mm. and maybe um, a little bit more depth and purposefulness than just uh, going to the mall and yeah. taking out your credit card. Well, that mm-hmm. was mine, but I, yeah, okay. I, can do a different, we can, I can do a different one. My, one of my favorite ones is once a year, there's this little tiny church in town that does like one of those living nativities. Yeah. And it's just a like the youth group puts on the play. And so they, they build like the big kind of manger yeah. thing. And yeah. then it's, it's, and it's very unimp- wear robes. And, and the whole thing is very unimpressive, you yeah. know? And then there's like a voiceover person that's saying, that's, you know, reading the Christmas story. And so is it like a eight o'clock performance or is this just going on all <laughs> no, night? And people right. kind of just an eight drive o'clock by. performance. Okay. And there's like 50 people there. <laughs> it's a real small little church thing we just stumbled upon because we used to live close to this church. And then everybody goes into the, fellowship hall afterwards and all the old ladies have made uh, cookies and they take pictures and it's just a really sweet thing. But I find that in the entire season, we get to do a lot of fun like Christmas parties and stuff like that. There's a real grounding moment for that because the girls can quote the the story and we all, it's just like this beautiful tradition. That's like, okay, that's what's real. That, that right. feels like, that feels like it's a very grounding moment and we just don't miss that. Good. Yeah, that, yeah, that's so, like that's that so, so good, that's, Eddie. It's it's similar to something I've been doing for years. Here we go. So, with, <laughs> with living with living nativity scenes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I scope one out and I go and I fashion my own costume that matches. <laughs> and uh, on the most crowded Wait, like night, a, are you a fourth wise man? I go and do a little plot twist to the Christmas story and see how well the actors take it. All of a sudden, you know what the Christmas story needs? A good on-the-scene villain. And I, it, it ends with a fight between me and Joseph that he is not prepared for. That he conquers me. The people love it. They love it. It's, uh, like it's a little plot twist. It's not a lot of action in the Christmas story. You're Spoiler on the roof alert. of the manger just oh throwing the star. Yeah, oh my yeah exactly. I mean, I've done various things. I've climbed on top of the manger and started ranting like a wild man and made Joseph pull me off. The crowd goes wild when I'm finally, when I'm finally removed each year. And I've had, to, I've had to give the disguises more and more elaborate because they're on the lookout for me. So, uh, But it's, it's just a good thing, you know? It's just one of those... The community, the community really gets into this thing. Well, you're so. making you're making memories for other people. So that's, that's right. really your that's gift right. to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's and like, hey, remember that Christmas win? When that oh, guy. that's so sweet. Yeah, for what it's worth, that beautiful tradition will now be destroyed because I'll just be sitting there laughing, <laughs> thinking about Jesse coming out, you know, with his guns blazing, introducing oh. the frankincense picking and myrrh, picking a fight, Joseph. trying to trying to kidnap a camel and picking a fight with Joseph. Just a, yeah. you know, it's a little, it's kind of an improv thing, you know. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. quite quite. <laughs> Quite the scene. Quite the There's scene. There's wiggle room in the So we want to know uh, actual things that you <laughs> yeah. and your friends, your family do uh, to try and uh, remember the the real meaning of the season that doesn't entail maybe staging fights or yelling at children at the mall. You know? Maybe, <laughs> maybe someone for the show. I mean, if they do, I want to hear about those too. So. <laughs> just DM. Hit us up on Twitter at Relevant Podcast or you can post yours uh, your stories on the podcast episode page at relevantmagazine.com. Well, many thanks to the this episode's sponsors for making the show possible. Remember, you can uh, find out more about the work of Samaritan Ministries and take part in uh, their community of believers that are sh- uh, covering the healthcare needs of the other members. Yeah. Uh, you can find out more at SamaritanMinistries.org. Currently, one member, uh, one person memberships start at just $100. Also, thanks to Warby Parker. You can go to warbyparker.com slash relevant to order your free home tryouts today or check out their iTunes app uh, if you have an iPhone 10. It's pretty sweet. Uh, also, thanks to HelloFresh for providing dinner for me and my kid this week. <laughs> it's and quite delicious. Yeah. And many weeks, actually. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit hellofresh.com slash relevant and enter offer code relevant30. Also, thanks to our guests for joining us this week. Uh, Drake, his new album is... I'm kidding. Thanks to Cody Carnes. <laughs> Cody's new album is called The Darker the Night, The Brighter the Morning. Uh, go check it out. And also, watch the performances of uh, those songs he, that you heard on the show today. You can see the videos on the relevant YouTube channel or on our website. 
Hey, right now, uh, if you're thinking of a thoughtful gift to give that doesn't cost that much money, uh, subscriptions to Relevant are a good place to start. Mm -hmm. You can uh, give a gift that keeps giving all year long. And uh, we are running some special uh, Christmas promotions right now at the website. You can subscribe or give a gift subscription today at relevantmagazine.com. Hey, if you subscribe now, uh, you'll get uh, you'll get our brand new issue that we just sent to the printer. We will tell you more about that in coming weeks, but you won't want to miss it. It's a, it's a really awesome issue. A little Not- teaser for who's on the cover. True teaser. Big white beard. Big <laughs> jelly. He oh. rearranged his name. It may be <laughs> Satan. Gene Shallot. Gene Shallot on the <laughs> <Gene> Shallot <laughs> on the cover. Yeah. In memorandum. It's a right. whole <laughs> issue dedicated to the life and work of Gene Shallot. <laughs> we really got to get some intel a, on a his A tribute wherever. that uh, is long overdue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, we'll wrap it up. I'm Cameron Strang. I'm Eddie Koffoltz. I'm Andre Henry. I'm Chandler Strang. I'm Jesse Carey. We'll see you guys next week. listening to the relevant podcast if you like what you heard be sure to leave us a review on itunes check out other shows from the relevant podcast network in the podcast section at relevantmagazine.com and while you're there browse exclusive podcast merchandise at our online store make sure to subscribe to relevant magazine info is available at relevantmagazine.com forward slash subscribe so tall kiss you once and then some more wish you a merry christmas baby wish you a merry christmas baby. and such happiness in the coming year if i feel like the right thing to do is scream at a bunch of kids i scream at them all the time